today we are happy to hear Mykola Didyushenko. He will talk about theory changing interfaces and quantum algebra. Thank you. Um, thanks a lot for the invitation and also shout out to the organizers for being extra creative with this conference format this year. So this talk is based on the upcoming work with Nikita Nikrasov. It will hopefully appear soon. We're working hard to finish the paper. So here's some photographic evidence of hard work. Uh, so uh, the topic uh, lies at the intersection of several general ideas. First, quantum field theories, as any natural objects, they come in families. So it's natural to ask about interfaces between different members of the family, whether they exist. And when they do, you can collide interfaces and see what happens. In particular, this leads naturally to the idea of sort of symmetries or more general groups or algebras acting on the families of theories. And they can act between different theories uh, with uh, generators realized by interfaces that would extend the usual notion of symmetries that act within one theory, but I could have mentioned one defect. And in my case, I don't, I'm, I don't assume them to be uh, topological. And uh, if those interfaces preserve some supersymmetry, they lead to interesting structures in the QCO homology. And on the other hand, there's also the idea of wall crossing. And then we will be looking at how uh, spaces of supersymmetric vacuum transform as you go across walls in the parameter space, namely mass and the five parameters of this theory. And uh, that's also related to mirror symmetry and specific more and uh, symplectic duality, where you could consider walls by adjusting parameters. You could consider walls between Higgs, Coulomb, or say CFT phases of your theory. But uh, the main motivation really comes from Beth Gage correspondence of Nikras von Shadashvili, where on the left hand side you have a quantum integrable system, and on the right you actually have a family of quantum field theories, supersymmetric quantum field theories. And the Hilbert space on the left corresponds to the sum of supersymmetric vacuum on the right between among all those theories. And there's an algebra A acting um, on the left, well, acting on the Hilbert space of your theory. Uh, the spectrum generating algebra that could be a yang yen or quantum loop or quantum elliptic algebra. So one could wonder what's the realization on the right and if it acts between different members of the family, can you construct interfaces realizing uh, those actions? Um, and the main um, example of the family you can think of is uh, the following, assume, uh, so imagine a gauge theory with UN gauge group and L fundamental hypermultiplets. So this is a theory with eight supercharges. Um, L is fixed and N labels members of the family. It goes from zero to L. And on the left, the corresponding integrable system is XXX or XXY or XYZ spin chain, depending on the dimension your quantum field theory lives in and the supercharge you pick. Uh, another big motivation comes from the geometric constructions uh, namely the stable envelopes by Molly Kokonkov and also Aganagi Shinokonkov in the elliptic case, which are certain general um, natural geometric building blocks from which you construct our matrices. Uh, and once you have our matrix, you have, you know how the, this algebra A acts. Uh, and related constructions by Nakajima and Varanolo, who uh, constructed actions of Yangians and quantum loop algebras on the equivariance cohomology and K theory of, of the Nakajima variety. So, and in both cases, those uh, constructions proceed along similar steps. They're using Lagrangian correspondences in the products of uh, varieties, which look like BAA, bra BAA brains in some hypercalar manifold. So they suggest that there's some boundaries or interfaces, supersymmetric interfaces. Now, this slide contains some you know, list, li very limited list of literature. Of course, the actual uh, list would contains hundreds of references. Uh, but I want to, so uh, here the beginning of time says this, uh, the sort of precursors of these Nakajima and Ranolo papers, um, nine years before the Bethe Gage correspondence. And already in the original idea, there was this uh, idea that there should be some brains realizing the action of A. Uh, so, um, yeah, I encourage you to go back to the PDF file and look carefully into this list of references, but I have to skip to save some time. So the basic setup is a uh, gauge theory with eight supercharges, uh, some gauge group on the flavor group GH. We, let's fix the maximal torus of GH, A, 
And then U1 H bar is this special uh, R symmetry of the theory with eight supercharges that from the point of view of theory with two or four supercharges looks like a flavor symmetry. So backgrounds for U1 H bar uh, break um, um, half of Suzy. And then we consider this also bigger torus T. Now we will be working in three, two, and one dimensions. When we are in three dimensions, the, the place the theory on the product of elliptic curve and time, Euclidean timeline. Um, and the interfaces will be wrapped on the elliptic curve. So they act um, on the corresponding Hilbert space and also on the space of ground states since they're supersymmetric interfaces, as we'll see. And then in two dimensional case, we just replace the elliptic curve by S1 and in the one dimensional case by a point. And additionally, in the three dimensional case, there is additional symmetry, the Quillen branch symmetry, which whose maximal torus was realized by the topological symmetries, as is well known. Now, what super, as I mentioned, the structures are in the QCO homology. So what supercharge are we looking at? Um, so it, it is most convenient to describe it in the 2D 2,2 language. It is probably the most uh, uh, familiar to everyone. So recall that there are four interesting superchargers in, in this case. Um, so B model supercharge and the holomorphic supercharge, once you lift them to three dimensions, they both become the supercharge of the holomorphic topological twist, in particular known from these papers and most recent Costello de Mosto Gaiota. In the A model case, the, the, they live to the 3D A twist, super, no, uh, supercharge. And in the, but then there's fourth one, the omega deformation Q, which is sort of in between A and B. It is preserved both by A and B brains. And if you lift them if to three dimensions, it is the supercharge that squares to the anti holomorphic translation along the elliptic curve. That's at least how we choose it. And we'll be studying its cohomology. And operators in the Q cohomology are clearly. They, they are extended objects. They must wrap this E tau. They will be interfaces. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, well, you also can alternatively think of it as a 3D n equals one supercharge. Okay, so let's, uh, I will mostly focus on stable envelopes and explain our matrices later. So in our, so this is the picture of our basic setup. We also turn on flat connections for the flavor symmetry and for the this special H bar symmetry and also for the topological symmetry. So. These ones, the topological uh, connections, they are uh, usually referred to as uh, Keller parameters. And these are equivariant parameters. Now, when you reduce to two dimensions, Keller parameters are replaced by theta angles. And in 1D, they disappear completely. You only have equivariant parameters in the one dimensional case. Um, now, let's focus on the theory in the Higgs space. Let X be the Higgs branch. We know that the space of supersymmetric vacuum in the quantum mechanical case is given by the uh, cohomology, on our, in our case, equivariant cohomology, that goes back to Witten's paper on Morse theory. Now, when we work with our specific Q and go to two-dimensional case, it is natural to identify the space of vacuum with the equivariance K theory uh, of a complex numbers. And then three-dimensional case, uh, it's related to the elliptic cohomology, but not just strictly equal because this LT of X, this object, at least in the following the same approach that uh, open Coven collaborators followed. It's not a space, it's a, it's a scheme that generalizes the, uh, say, sch such schemes as the spec of a homology ring. But in elliptic case, it's no longer fine, so it's not really a spec of anything. So you just study bundles over this LT, and there is a natural bundle of vacuum whose sections are related to this space. Uh, unfortunately, no, I don't have time for this story, so I'll just focus on the cohomological case uh, it is, as it's simpler uh, to describe in a short amount of time. So let me also quickly tell you what stable envelopes are. So let A be the torus of our flavor group. Could be the, um, doesn't have to be the maximal torus, but you can think of the maximal torus. And X, it's our Higgs branch. And XA is the fixed locus uh, with respect to the A action. Um, pick a fixed point P in the fixed locus. Then you can uh, consider the full attractor of P uh, for the complexified action of your torus. So uh, there are these red lines represent uh, trajectories or orbits of the complexified action. You can consider all orbits that end at P. And if some of them also start at some other fixed po uh, critical point P prime, you can also consider all uh, trajectories that end at P prime and so on. And this whole beast is usually referred to as the full attractor of P. 
Now, uh, it turns out that there is a natural way to extend cohomology equivariant cohomology classes from the fixed locus to the entire X. Um, and in such a way that you start with a cohomology class in your fixed point and you sort of extend it along the full attractor. And that's the idea behind the stable envelopes. And in our case, physically, of course, these are spaces of vacuum. So we're, we're going to get some map between spaces of vacuum. And these things also have generalization to K-theoretic and elliptic cases. Uh, this fixed locus can also be identified with the Higgs branch of the theory in which you have turned on real uh, large real masses for the flavor symmetry A. So your original theory had Higgs branch X, then you turn on real masses for the, this torus A and crank them up to infinity. You get theory whose effectively the theory whose Higgs branch is the fixed locus. It, and it turns out that you can actually um, change uh, masses in the supersymmetric way. So recall that R is our Euclidean time direction. It is possible to vary real masses in this direction, or I mean, if you're in a flat space in any direction, but we we are on R times the torus, so we vary real masses in the R direction while preserving one half of supersymmetry. All we have to do is to add this additional term in the action that has the derivative of mass in the Euclidean action. Um, so in particular, we can have the following configuration where mass is zero on the left and some generic large mass on the right. And there is a natural supersymmetric interface that interpolates between the two regions. So this interface, of course, we'll call them Janus interface for masses or maybe mass uh, Janus as um, following the tradition in the literature for such objects. And uh, the, the proposal is that it actually realizes uh, stable envelopes in this um, gauge theoretic context. Now, why is that? Well, simply because the BPS equations uh, give you uh, flows for the complexified tours, or you can think of them as gradient flows for the following uh, potential, where you take real moment map for the flavor symmetry times, times your y-dependent mass and uh, real moment map for gauge theory times sigma. Or if you restrict this to the Higgs branch, you will get a Morse, the following Morse function on the Higgs branch, where, okay, of course, it's written in the ambient space coordinates. The actual function is complicated. But in theories with eight supercharges, all critical points of this function have equal indices, equal to have the target dimension. So uh, you get uh, the corresponding gradient flows connecting this uh, critical points. They don't really contribute to the differential on the more smale wooden complex. Um, so the critical points give you exact vacuum, but these gradient flows nevertheless contribute to other things, like when you start changing your Morse function, start deforming your theory. And uh, in particular, you can, uh, so you see that here mass depends on Y and Y is our Euclidean time. So what we really, really have is a time dependent Morse function. So, let, so uh, let me just consider the supersymmetric quantum mechanics as in Witten's paper. With the target space, the Higgs branch out of our theory and Morse function f representing the effect of masses. And the Morse function now depends on time explicitly. Now, where the Morse function is time independent, we usually write the action as a Q exact term plus the topological term like this. We would like to use the same action in the case when f is time dependent. Um, so you just have to make sure that this additional term is included so that you can assemble this total derivative term. And this additional term that, was, that we include is precisely what we had before to make the Janus interface supersymmetric. You can just uh, independently infer it using the supersymmetry variations. So, um, so okay, so we're using, gonna use this action and uh, the, you can see already from here so that, that the variations of your Morse function that vanish at infinity, the Q exact deformation. So in other words, it, the Morse function somehow changes with time, but if you keep and you can um, wiggle it while keeping the asymptotic uh, values, the asymptotic functions uh, fixed. And then this gives you Q exact deformations of the theory and they should not be visible uh, for the BPS computations. Uh, now, if you look uh, at the operator formulation of this theory, uh, so recall that in the standard uh, uh, formulation, the, the Hilbert space is identified with the differential forms on your target, and then you have supercharges acting like these operators. And if you don't have this term, you just have the usual uh, Hamiltonian given by the commutator, 
then this theory of course is unitary, but it breaks Susie once that you start changing F with time. But if you include this additional term, you actually preserve Q while break Q dagger. And this conservation of Q is expressed by this equation where this additional term is, reflects the explicit time dependence of F, but this is the conservation law for Q. But now, now the, this term breaks unitarity. Uh, so this is a non-unitary deformation, uh, but it's actually perfectly fine because what we want to do is an interface that inter interpolates between theories with different Morris functions. And uh, that interface will act as some operator in the Hilbert space. And there's absolutely no reason for that operator to be unitary because most observables are, are not represented by unitary operators. But we ha have to be careful because, um, so we actually choose this option, non-unitary deformation, but we have to be careful because now with this non-unitary evolution, like you might end up exiting the Hilbert space and getting some unnormalizable states. Uh, it is actually convenient to conjugate by each of the F such that the differential is just D. And uh, now the Hamiltonian, the Hamiltonian because of the way it transforms under this conjugation becomes D exact. Uh, this conjugation simply corresponds to dropping the topological term. So the action is Q exact and it's just the square of the gradient trajectory equation plus some super partners. But because H is D exact, namely it seems like the evolution is trivial in the cohomology. The Hamiltonian is exact. And, and uh, that's correct if the target manifold is compact. But if your target is non-compact, things might happen. And in particular, as you'll see, non, non, uh, an L2 function, for example, can become unnormalizable. Yet the uh, overlap with a normalizable function is well-defined. So the matrix elements between normalizable states of this interface are well-defined, and that's all we need. Now, let me uh, explain this in the toy example. Suppose the target is just a complex plane, and this is our Morse function, the, so just uh, distance squared, and M is a parameter, real, uh, like you think of it as mass. It can, be, it, have, it can have either sign or be even zero. The Hamiltonian has two states in the kernel, the zero Fermion number state, the Fermion number two state, and uh, the... Um, if mass is positive, then only the first one is square normalizable. If M is negative, only the second one is normalizable. And furthermore, you can check that in the case when F is time dependent, the first one is actually still a solution when F changes with time. It simply solves the Schrodinger equation. So what you can do, you can, we'll consider the following configuration. Start with positive mass in the far past and assume that mass becomes zero in the future. And in the, in the past, we start with this normalizable state e to the minus f, but then in the future, because mass becomes zero, it just simply becomes one, so which is uh, not square normalizable. So we must be in trouble, right? But so far, I've ignored equivariance. Uh, just consider this without equivariant parameters and equivariance actually saves the day. You, if you replace d by the equivariant differential uh, for, for the rotations of the plane, you can, solve the corresponding problem exactly and find the ground states. And they're always square normalizable, even when mass is zero, uh, because this epsilon is present here. And now you can compute uh, the overlaps, this sort of uh, transition amplitudes between regions with different M. It is convenient to assume that M changes as a, behaves as a step function because it's of a shape independence. So we can just compute this transition from M to zero and get some answer. In fact, we can do this in all possible cases, say going from M to zero or from zero to M. And notice that the corresponding answers are uh, reciprocals of each other because, uh, well, if you go from M to zero and then back to M, in this configuration, you can deform the mass profile such that it remains M all the time and hence nothing should happen. And indeed we get up inverse answers or you can go from minus m to zero, zero to minus m, or from m to minus m. Now notice that this one from m to minus m can be deformed into going from m to zero and then from zero to minus m. And uh, indeed, the corresponding answer is the product of, of these S's. So everything just, it confirms our expectations. And in fact, these S's are the analogs, the toy analogs of stable envelopes and R, when you go from m to minus m, the analog of R matrix, as, as we'll see. Uh, so the general story goes like this, your fixed point P at infinity and uh, the fixed point. 
And then the region with non-zero mass prepares you in the limit of large mass and large metric prepares you a certain uh, wave function. Like, yes, five, minutes five minutes till uh, questions yes, start. Yes. Uh, it prepares you a certain um, differential um, delta-like form uh, supported on the attractor. And then you overlap uh, with the probe equivariant form in the mass equals zero region. And that's the matrix element that we compute. Of course, this is all a simplification. And what we really do in, um, in the toy example, we had only one vacuum, so nothing could really happen. In actual examples, the target space is more complicated. It has many non, uh, fixed points and SM are non-trivial upper or lower triangular matrices that describe transitions between them. And also all computations that don't engage theory in practice because nonlinear sigma models are uh, complicated and uh, via localization. And also the time is replaced by an interval with some boundary conditions representing uh, vacuum, thimble boundary conditions. Well, because it's a little bit complicated to unclear, there are some problems with localization on the non-compact space. I, I can comment on it later why. Uh, here's a summary of the interval computation, which is just for you to look later if you want to. I'm going to skip it. Just a comment that once we're working in quantum field theory, so besides this interval or the time direction, there's also uh, circles. You can consider a circle as a time, as your time, and then it gives you a more conventional interpretation as an index in a certain soliton sector. Um, but, if, but in 1D, there's only this interval direction, so it has to be considered as time. And if you want to work uniformly in, in that space-time dimension, it makes sense to think of that direction as time even in 2D and in 3D. Uh, now, um, how do you construct R matrices? They are sort of as ratios of these stable envelopes, as I already said, where you go, which basically means that you go from one value of mass to another value of mass, which corresponds to, say, different chambers in the parameter space. In the simplest case, when there's only one mass, you can imagine just the following configuration where mass is positive here, negative here. And this interface, that's what's going to realize the R matrix. Let me give you an example um, how to actually, uh, that this one is enough to construct interfaces realizing the SL2 yang yang in this case. So we, we wanted to realize the raising and lowering operators. In other words, the theory on the left is UN gauge theory with L hypers. On the right, UN plus one gauge theory with L hypers in the fundamental. And uh, okay, uh, what we do is inspired by Mariko Nokunkov, consider the following theory with one extra hypermultiplex. And in this theory, you have one more flavor symmetry, one more U1 flavor symmetry that rotates this additional hyper and let M be the real mass for this uh, additional hyper. If you crank up this mass to infinity, the theory decomposes into two sectors. One sector is just the theory without this hyper. And another sector is where a gauge group is broken from UN plus one to UN times U1 by Higgs mechanism. So now to make these two sectors talk, we consider an interface where mass goes to large positive to large negative. And um, the interface is zero, and that's where the two sectors talk to each other. And you get a certain block matrix representing this interface. And in particular, the A, B, and B, A blocks are where the rank changes. Well, you sort of ignore this trivial factor and just consider these two. And they provide the realization of the raising and lowering operators in the Yang Yang. And then this can be generalized to arbitrary quivers. And of course, there's a lot of things I don't have time to talk about, like uh, I didn't mentioned, uh, I didn't give you at all details about the elliptic case uh, from which in principle, everything else follows by taking the limits. The details of interval computation, construction of more gen of general R matrices for general quiver varieties. Um, there's also Janus interface with five uh, parameters that realize a stable envelopes on the Coulomb branch. There is uh, an interesting story about half index and index. You can take the three dimensional index and stretch it into a cigar or into a sausage and to prove that the corresponding squashing parameter is a trivial deformation of the THF using techniques of this paper. And then use that to relate to the holomorphic blocks and uh, half indices. Um, um, and, uh, also, and then see that I'll use that to see that our interface sort of describes the wall crossing of the half index. You act with the interface and you get uh, the, the value of the index in different phase of the theory. And finally, there, is also, there also exists a string theory construction of these systems in the string theory compactifier in the LE space. And then you can use dualities to relate constructions in QQ and QA supercharges, and also connect with the 4D transformers approach to integrability. And finally, the future directions include, so first, uh, we really constructed our interfaces so, sort of up to quasi-isomorphism, which means that you can wiggle the 
shape of masses and you get in principle different interface, but at the level of cuckoo homology, it's the same one. So that leads to uh, questions about derived structures, high operations, stuff like that. Then the discussion in terms of more theory suggests that the generalization to few supercharges might be possible, maybe not as well behaved. Then uh, the sup our supercharge Q can be lifted to A model supercharge in D plus one dimensions um, in an appropriate way. So it suggests that these constructions have analogs in the quantum cohomology and quantum K theory cases and lifting from 1D to QA in 2D suggests that there must be connections to Gayota Moore Witten paper where, where they studied um, the Lando Ginsburg models with the uh, interfaces where parameter change, parameters change uh, and with respect to the A model supercharge. And that's where I end. Um, thank you. So let's proceed to questions. See. Gregory Moore. Um, oh, hi, yes, I, indeed, I was, I was meaning to ask about the very last point. Um, so uh, I got a little worried when you started talking about the non-unitarity, the, the, the tension between um, preserving supersymmetry and non-unitarity. You're not saying that there's a problem with um, using this kind of construction to construct uh, half supersymmetric interfaces in, in one plus one dimensional theories. No, the, there's not, not really a problem because the matrix elements between the L2 states are always finite. And well, when you are in higher dimensions, you can always reinterpret the circle direction as time, and then there will be no problems with unitary. Okay, good, 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 thanks. More questions? Then maybe let me ask a question. I understand that you consider mass deformation, which is Q exact, right? Mm -hmm. So um, does your approach uh, include sometimes integration of uh, this mass deformation in the spirit of string theory? No, not really. Uh, so the dependence of this mass deformation is sort of, uh, um, you can say it's pathwise constant, or so it depends on the chamber in which you take mass. So the, I mentioned that uh, the parameter space is uh, separated into chambers, and the walls are where the hypermultiples become massless, and things happen when you go across those walls. But uh, when you stay within the chamber and just send mass to infinity, nothing depends on that. Um, and well, in fact, we work in the limit of this mass going to infinity. And uh, yeah, so we are really in the field theory context, at least for now. Okay, uh, maybe a question from Jerome Gauntlet. I, uh, it's actually just, just a comment um, and it's um, probably, uh, complementary uh, kind of work that I wanted just to mention that I did with some uh, postdocs, um, Igal Arav, Matt Roberts, Chris Rosen, and my graduate student, Matthew Chung. But it's from a gravitational point of view when we uh, constructed uh, configurations which separate two different um, uh, theories by an interface preserving superconformal invariance. So we call these RG interfaces. So the, the nice example that we have was uh, a gravitational solution that has n equals four Young Mills theory on the one side, and the so-called Lee Strassler fixed point, which comes from an n equals one star mass deformation. And the configura so the configuration is supported by uh, a mass deformation of, of n equals four Young Mills theory uh, and realizes a superconformal symmetry on the interface itself. So it's as I said, it's probably complementary work to what you're doing, but it may possibly play some role or you might be able to use some of your techniques in that for that particular context. Um, yeah, thank you. Maybe uh, I am actually, uh, I suspect that I suspect that uh, it is included in the sort of larger list of references, but, uh, but uh, you can send me the link just in case it's something I didn't know about. I will do. Thank you. Gregory, do you have another question? I do. Uh, maybe it's a better question. Uh, so. So you have a raising operator. So presumably you also have a lowering operator. So now right. there's some nice algebraic relations like Serre generalization, Serre relations and their generalization in the Yangian. 
That's right. Can you, can, is that going to involve some kind of operator product of interfaces and things like that? Uh, yes. So um, in this approach through R matrices, all the relations, they just follow from RTT relations of the Yangian. And you get RTT relations by uh, considering uh, several walls. So the simplest uh, setting is imagine that you have uh, uh, three masses. And so you have M1, M2, M3, and then there are walls where M1 equals M2, M1 equals M3, and M2 equals M3. And then you say go from one chamber to another, to the opposite chamber, and you can cross the three walls either this way or in this way. And that gives you the Young-Baxter equation for, for the R matrices, which implies the RTT relation for the Youngian that you get using this construction. Um, it would, right, yeah. So that's the simplest way to see it. I think we should proceed to, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mikola. Yeah. Uh, let us proceed to uh, the talk of Kevin Costello about uh, four-dimensional integrable theories from twisters. All right.